Morning, and welcome to the Wildlife Podcast. Today's guest is Tom Baxter, mushroom cultivator and founder of Bristol Fungarium. So a good chat about medicinal mushrooms and how you can implement them into your daily life is right ahead. So without further ado, enjoy. So there's a new TV show out, it's called The Last of Us, and it's massively into cordyceps and it's getting a lot of people interested. So um, so yeah, what actually, what actually are cordyceps and what should people be worried about? Are they concerned about, you know, infecting humans or uh, what, uh, what should they be scared about or fascinated about? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the cordyceps is uh, the most recent uh, sort of clade or family within um, the mushroom kingdom. So it came around about 300 million years ago. Uh, there's about 700 uh, different types of cordyceps. The, they're actually called ortho uh, cordycepin. I know ortho cordyceps. Um, uh, there's absolutely nothing to worry about from a human's perspective. Um, they only, I mean, they are, what's interesting about them, they are parasitical, so they parasitize upon various different things, insects, grubs, uh, other mushrooms. Um, so yeah, there's like, there's no, no ability for a cordycep to, in, in, in any way, get control of a mammal <laughs> um, so uh yeah we actually grow more cordyceps than any other company in europe uh so we grow cordycep militaris um one of which actually is a clone of what well, a clone across of one that we found in, in cornwall um so yeah cordyceps is quite an interesting one because it's um the i mean originally cordyceps has been used for probably over a thousand years in uh, traditional chinese medicine uh, what happened was the um, yak herders sort of on the Tibetan plateau noticed the uh, yaks eating these little brown mushrooms uh, that grow up a bit like, um, well, a bit like little stalks. And then they noticed they got very, very, very enthusiastic for the ladies and um, started shagging everything that was, you know, within their distance. And although it isn't actually rutting season, at that point of the year, they started behaving like it was rutting season. And so that was when humans started eating them. And actually the um, wild cordycep uh, sinensis uh, sells for more per gram than gold currently. Um, it's been heavily over, uh, yeah, over, you know, collected forage, whatever the word is, which has obviously cut the, uh, cut the supply of it down and pushed the price up. So we grow uh, Cordyceps militaris, and the um, we're lucky in that we've had quite we have quite a few uh, professional rugby players that take our product. Uh, it's very good at increasing VSO max and down regulating inflammation of the brain, amongst various other things. Um, so and yeah, the the um, ex chief nutritionist for uh, Great Britain Rugby League uh, has recommended us to quite a few guys. So actually, I think probably the team that there's probably over 20 professional rugby league players and six professional rugby union players that are now taking our product. Um, and interestingly, the team that is top of the Super League at the moment, Catalan Dragons, a French team, uh, are, there's more of them taking our are cordyceps and any other team in the Super League. So uh, who knows? But yeah, there's absolutely no plausible way that cordyceps could uh, in any shape or form take over a Homo sapiens sapien or any mammal for that case. Yeah, no, that's really interesting. So um, I did a bit of reading and it, how like um, it was in Chinese medicine and it was like yang invigorating and uh, yin nourishing or something like that. And that actually transfers in, over the scientific literature. There's a lot of like um, support on this. And one thing I saw was the fact that it causes vasodilation, that like opens up the um, your blood vessels. And the the benefit that has is is a lot because when you hit muscle failure at the gym, you know um, that's just because your muscles are overheating. So if you can sort of um, regulate your body temperature through stuff like vasodilation, it means you can do way more in sport. So um, yeah, obviously as someone that does sport and obviously like you know the people on rugby um taking it it has a massive benefit so um yeah no i, I really do endorse that but there, there, um, there are a lot of other athletes to take it i mean the, the reason that cordyceps originally became um sort of relatively well known in the west was the uh i think it was the 96 olympics uh when a lot of chinese athletes 
did ridiculously well in quite a few different um, disciplines and they were all on cordyceps. I mean, they were probably all on the juice as well, but they were all on cordyceps. And, you know, the Norwegian Winter Olympic team have taken cordyceps in the past decade. They do. It's really good for endurance stuff. It basically increases your um, body's capacity for uh, carrying oxygen, uh, in essence, and your muscles' ability due to that dilation to get more oxygen into the muscles, um, which obviously means that you can push more power if you're that way inclined. Uh, but for the rugby guys, what's really interesting is its ability to downregulate inflammation on the brain, um, and that's as useful as actually the uh, the sort of stimulation it gives. Um, I, I mean, it's also known as Himalayan Viagra. So uh, it's uh, yeah, I mean, it's been given as natural dizzy for both men and women actually for a very long period of time. And I think, to be honest, cordyceps is probably gonna be the um the family of mushrooms that we hear a lot more of from a, a, a human health perspective because of the 600 known different types of cordyceps only, there's only really two that are used from a human health perspective because uh you know just the research hasn't been done china is so far ahead of us in terms of their ability to um do the science fundamentally uh so yeah, so I mean, I think cordyceps is going to be the one. We grow around about 100 kilos a month of um, cordyceps, um, which has taken us quite a while because they're, you know, in, in the wild, the cordyceps militaris, uh, they parasit parasitize on um, the ghost moth fungus, which grows, you know, under the ground. Um, and... Uh, that one, you know, we can't, you can't actually cultivate that one um, without using that. We haven't been able to work out how without using that um, that host. And so the one that we all, that everyone grows is Cordyceps militaris. Again, the Chinese came up with a way of commercially cultivating it uh, based on a rice substrate about 20 years ago. Um, and so that's really what's caused the big boom in people being able to take uh, Cordyceps nice nice so um how do you actually cultivate them because it's quite an interesting thing if it parasitizes on them um you know is there a substrate is there you know a, a host it's of choice or complicated we basically make a broth mix and it's got 17 different things in so we use stuff like spirulina various different peptides peptones um seaweed I mean, it's, there are lots of different broth recipes you're trying to basically in essence create the same um sort of chemical composition and proteins as are available in you know the um caterpillar or the grub that it's growing from and um, obviously because we're vegan you're having to do that without using any you know, animal products um egg whites if we weren't a vegan oriented company we could use egg whites which has a pretty good um you know mix of proteins in it for them to parasitize off so you have to sterilize the grain make a huge amount of liquid sub uh, liquid mycelium um and then you inject that into the tubs that you're um, that you're growing it on and it takes around about i don't know three months um the mushrooms are very small so uh you know you need to grow a lot of these very small mushrooms in order for them to um, you know. yeah yeah so um I actually went to Costa Rica uh, beginning of the year and I actually saw a cordyceps mushroom infected ant. It was a huge ant, absolutely massive. And it was underneath a leaf. And I don't know how someone saw it, but it would just had branches of, um, you know, the, the mushroom coming out. And it was the most fascinating thing. And um, yeah, that, that, that was shocking. So how long after the ant, you know, just in nature, how long after, it doesn't have to be the ant, but just the host is infected. How long is it from infection to... Um, the mushroom growing sort of thing uh well it, i mean it can be up to five years depending on the life cycle of uh what the host is so the um yeah they can carry spores around for yeah up to five years and then you know when they um yeah when the the host then turns into a butterfly or whatever then it can or whatever it turns into um yeah then the mushroom can be so i mean they can they can sit around and wait 
for ages. The spores, it's slightly quicker. It depends, you know, it just depends entirely on what type of cordyceps it is. Some of them are much quicker. Uh, you know, there's the classic ones that everyone's seen in the uh, fantastic fungi uh, with the leaf cutter out that's going up to the top. I mean, it is amazing, especially if you see some of the cicadas who, you know, they look like there's no body or head or anything and they're still, you know, wandering around with these empty skeletons of, um, you know, cicadas or cockroaches as well. There's some, some that parasitize some cockroaches. And it's amazing just seeing these hollowed out insects wandering around for no apparent reason, with a little mushroom out the top of their head. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that's why cordyceps are, you know, mushrooms first popped up around about 1.2 million years ago, and there have been various different stages in the evolution of mushrooms, uh, and the final stage about 150 million years ago, uh, that's when we saw parasitic fungi, um, cordyceps, start, you know, coming into the sort of evolutionary tree yeah that, that's absolutely mad and uh you know just yeah just seeing the process in person and understanding how it works at least with some species and fantastic fungi was a very good documentary i think it definitely uh you know showed how crazy that specific fungus is but um what well, i was well, thinking this is actually gonna be an extern uh a couple of weeks hey what are you sorry he's gonna be an exeter oh wait paul stammers yeah he's gonna be an extern like I think on the on the eighteenth, I think eighteenth and nineteenth. Well, I'll look out for that because uh, the uni. What are the extra campus? Yeah, it's, there's like a um, big conference there that we're a part of called uh, Breaking Convention, and he's he's giving a talk there. A lot right. of a lot of uh, you know people are giving talks there as well who are probably a bit more sort of. Um, scientifically educated than paul um so yeah but yeah he'll be there if you want to see him yeah 100 percent. i think uh you know essays are due soon so i'll definitely look an eye out for it, keep an eye out for it and uh have a look i think yeah what's what's so good about i guess like paul stamets and many other scientific communicators is kind of um it's easy to sort of bridge the gap between the public and scientific literature i'll start reading mycology literature and it just blows my head off it, it just it is but yeah it is very um wordy some of it and as someone now got a degree in it it's um yeah it even still is quite hard so having some educators like himself and uh it really is quite cool to yeah, have I mean, public interested uh, you know it says a lot of things that are not true but like what well so many <laughs> things he says oh, are yeah. true. true um I don't even know where to start. I mean, there's so many things he says that are not true. Um, so a lot of, yeah, like, there's just so much. I think anyone in anyone in the sort of, uh, any mycologist you talk to or anyone who's actually doing real <laughs> research with mushrooms um, get a bit frustrated by the sort of grossly exaggerated claims that man perpetually makes. Um, but, you know, he's been very good at popularizing mushrooms and making a lot of people get interested in mushrooms um and if you ever read any of his patent applications then uh you know they're extraordinary i don't know if you've read many scientific patent applications but um, the ones done by paul are unique fair uh, enough yeah <laughs> they, uh, yeah you know, the patent application as vague and fluffy and um you know, like a brain dump, like someone's literally dumped all their thoughts onto a patent application. Patent applications are normally very legal, tight, defined uh, things, and pools are sort of the, the, the opposite of that. Fair enough. Yeah, let's um, give them a read later on, I think. Give but um, what, so what is the mushroom extraction process? Because I'll try to watch some YouTube videos of how they do it, and it's quite like laboratory, how it's done. So how, yeah, can you run us through how it's done? On labs, I mean, fundamentally what we do is we grow the mushrooms to start with. This is also very different to what Paul Stamets does with his product, which is another sort of bone of contention with a lot of people. So what we do is we grow the mushrooms, the fruiting bodies, um, such as, well, I've got... So you've got 
There's a turkey tail one that I've just picked. I don't know if you can see that one, is it? Oh, yeah. Turkey tail. So we'll pick the mushrooms, whichever one it is. Uh, then we'll dry them at 40 degrees in the infrared dehydrator. Uh, then we'll powder them up to create as much surface area as possible. And then we'll cook them initially in uh, 100 litres of water at 65 degrees for 24 hours. Um, the Some of the compounds in mushrooms, such as beta-glucanes, uh, they're long-chain polysaccharides. Um, they Above sort of 65 degrees, they uh, get destroyed. And um, that's the reason we sort of cook at that temperature for the longest period of time. So then we extract from the mushroom into about yeah, 100 litres of water. And then we cook under pressure at 15 PSI. Um, the same, uh, some the same dried mushrooms. In, um, yeah, at about 115, uh, about 122 degrees for 40 litres, for about four hours in 40 litres. We combine the 100 litres of water with the other 40 litres of water. We then evaporate that off at 65 degrees down to 3.8 litres. And then we do uh, a 97% ethanol extraction using something called a sock slip, which is a bit of glassware uh, chemistry sort of stuff, where you basically evaporate off the ethanol. Goes into the big tube, which holds the dry um, mushrooms, percolates down through it, and then when the chamber fills up, it gets to a certain level and it recycles. And then what we do is we take 1.2 litres of the ethanol extraction, combine that with 3.8 litres of water extraction, and that's our final product. Um, there are other ways of doing it, which I won't go into in other detail, but the, I think what's interesting is, for example, Paul Stamets, he doesn't do any of that. Um, what he does is he grows mycelium on rice. So he doesn't even grow mushrooms. He just grows the mycelium uh, on a substrate of rice or oats sometimes. Um, and then he dries that and powders it and puts it into a capsule and sells it um much easier way of doing it uh, and i would love to do that myself because instead of having to wait well over it maybe three to six months for the mushrooms uh i could get that done in three weeks and i could make a lot more money unfortunately there's very little scientific evidence to back up that there's anything like the same quantity of compounds of interest in myceliated rice than there is in the actual fruiting body. Um, but it's a very good way of making money. Very good way. Yeah, sounds it. I mean, it sounds, like I said earlier, like laboratory sort of style. Is it something you can do at home? It sounds like a spin-off of Breaking yeah. Bad. Of course yeah. you can do. You can do that's what's kind of attractive about mycology. Mycology is sort of the last of the natural sciences. Um, but you can do it at home. You know, there's still thousands of fungi out there. In the UK, there's about 12,000 fungi we've identified. And there's probably, in reality, probably about, well, more than 50,000. Um, so there's loads that people can find and isolate. And you can you could do all this stuff at home. You just wouldn't make necessarily such a strong one. Um, because the issue is getting like 97% ethanol is quite expensive. You know, it's 25 litres is uh, one and a half grand. Uh, that we pay every week for our ethanol. Um, and, but you could do it in vodka or lower lower alcohol stuff. And you don't have to use a sock slot. You could use something else. I and mean, we've got a lab, but that's mainly for, you know, doing other stuff uh, in terms of, you know, strain selection and genetic type stuff. Um, but, yeah, we work with UE as well. So we work with the neuroscience department at UE and we, we co-sponsor a PhD student who's working on stem cells. Uh, particularly, specifically, we're looking at uh, compounds within our lion's vein and how they operate on, um, it's not actually stem, stem cells, it's early stage cancer cells. Um, anyway, so we're, we're the only people in, in the UK, maybe even in Europe, I'm not sure, but certainly in the UK who are doing um, any sort of clinical research on the compounds within these mushrooms. Um, so it'll be interesting to see where that, where that goes over the next couple of years. Yeah, there's a lot of popularity towards mycology now. There's a lot of media kind of showing it. And I think, like Abby mentioned in the beginning, the whole Last of Us mentioned like the, the wacky side of mycology, even though it's fantasy. But um, but yeah, talking about lion's mane, I tried growing lion's mane in summer, but um, it didn't go too well. It actually had some 
it was like orange it was, it was hanging over some of it was developed some of it wasn't and it had, it had like orange stuff at the bottom i ended up binning it because i thought that i can't be good but um yeah what actually is that stuff and yeah how, how was a good way of doing it because i had it in a garage and i got some sunlight i guess but um it had a plastic bag over it humidified it every day a couple sprays um cardboard box but yeah it turned orange and i was very concerned because none of the photos were orange <laughs> you know that were, were done yeah, yeah i mean it's it quite often when it goes orange it's just it's got too hot so were you growing it in the summer were you yeah yeah and it's like most mushrooms prefer like 16 degrees there or thereabouts and my, lion's mane is actually quite you know tolerant to different temperatures but if it all went orange then yeah it was probably got too hot but it would have been fine you know, it's just it's secondary metabolites that are just creating that orange look to it but yeah i mean lion's mane is a pretty easy one to grow lion's mane and oysters are the two easiest ones um to grow and lion's mane has got a, had a huge amount of money thrown behind the marketing of it recently and the lion's mane actually that we grow here which is slightly different we are slightly different to most other companies in this regard um a lot of the mushrooms we grow are ones that i found in the wild and that we've cloned in the lab uh so our maitake our turkey tail our reishi our uh any oysters we grow and our lion's mane they're all uk native strains and they're, and they're all actually very close to where we are outside bristol and so we've started supplying um rhs wisley with some of our strains and they're repopulating wisley which is sort of apart from uh q it's sort of the second best sort of horticultural um garden in the uk and we're also working with natural england looking at a couple of uh projects using certain brown rock fungi um and the effect that they have on in invert specific invertebrate numbers within a woodland setting to see if we can use uh introduce certain types of um fungi into sort of immature woodland to increase biodiversity so that's another project we're involved in at the moment yeah that, yeah very interesting stuff and uh yeah i'm looking forward to being able to actually read more into this i think um you know i've had a good time because what you're saying is really exciting stuff and uh, especially of lion's mane the reason why i grew lion's mane in the first place is because of neurogenesis that was the that's the main i can imagine when you said marketed mushroom that's the one that was you know wow that is almost ne like necessary almost kind of felt yeah also no actual evidence that that does happen really really there's none um because there's even like there is no evidence that any of these compounds can even cross the blood brain barrier there's only a couple of very small studies that have been done in japan looking at people with early onset dementia um and yeah they improved their sort of uh scores on international cognition tests by about 14 percent over 12 months uh to over 12 weeks sorry um so it's statistically significant but um we don't understand what's going on there because you know, people talk a lot about a couple of uh, compounds called heronacines and erinacines, um, and there's about six different heronacines and even more different erinacines. And these are tiny compounds, uh, so they have a very low molecular weight. So it's posited that because of that, they should be able to cross the blood brain barrier and create what people like to say is that they create a precursor to an enzyme called NGF, nerve growth factor, but that's actual bollocks all the compounds you need to create nerve growth growth factor are already in abundance on the other side of the blood brain barrier something does seem to be happening we're not entirely certain what but th this is why science and this is why us you know working with actual neuroscientists life is always a lot more complicated um so people want to sell products so they're telling everyone take this mushroom it'll sort your brain out and everyone at the moment is thinking that um yeah it's thinking that the problems are in our brains uh, whereas what's going on in some society in a greater sense is actually and within our bodies is actually causing a lot of problems that are manifesting themselves in our heads and so people like the idea that you can take a little pill or a little bit of lion's mane sort out your head and everything else will be great but quite often the issues are 
either in the society outside you or within your body and you're feeling those as you know issues that exist in your mind and so if someone offers you a little blue pill to take to sort your mind out a lot of people think everything will be great so yeah i mean having said that a lot of people that take our products do claim it helps with their brain so you know good for them but uh that's why we're spending fifty thousand pounds on a phd student out of our own pocket over the next three years to actually understand try and understand what's actually going on right yeah so uh, i can imagine you would not recommend doing boxing getting your head punched in and then taking a the little pill and going oh i'm all better now so yeah may maybe we'll leave that one out always recommend boxing i think anything that gets aggression out and um boxing is yeah boxing is a beautiful sport so um it's not necessarily particularly great for your head but uh you know i think i think boxing anything physical is yeah. one so um yeah and i'm fully in favor of boxing i just don't think you can fix your head by um by taking a pill yeah no i, I fully endorse boxing as well or any sort of martial art really but uh but yeah, yeah, to the assumption that, oh, it doesn't matter the damage now, I can just go home and take some lion's mane, you know, yeah, and that'll be it. Simple. I mean, unfortunately, like I've lost uh, my closest friend to something called motor neurone disease, and um, yeah, he was a very good rugby player, but for Exeter and Bath and those other people. Um, and that's definitely repressive hits on the brain. And so, you know, from my perspective, I'd love to be able to, you know, do some research because the, the, the interestingly with lion's mane, certainly around the myelin sheath, the myelin sheath covers all your nerves within your body. Um, and there is some evidence that lion's mane does seem to radically increase the reparation of the myelin sheath. So when people damage their nerves, there's, there is definitely, there is definitely evidence of that, that is true. Uh, and people quite often, because that there is a decent body of evidence for that, people then say that it should be able to do the same within the neurons in the brain, which requires these compounds to be able to cross the blood brain barrier. And they might be able to cross the blood brain barrier, but at the moment we have no proof that they cross the blood brain barrier. But we do have evidence that lion's mane is very good for uh, repairing the myelin sheath. So lion's mane is definitely good for certain things. It's just the things that it's definitely good for are not the things that people are buying it for. Yeah, I can imagine there's a lot of like ethical concerns. Yeah, getting live people to do these brain studies. Um, I mean, I'm yeah, I need to look more into the methodology of it. But I can imagine there's a lot of restrictions within the scientific literature. I can imagine that annoying a lot of people that want to get the real science, the real benefits. I don't know, like, you know, doing brain scans and stuff. It's very difficult. I mean, I, I know a few people in the sort of psychedelic research side where they are using you know brain scans and stuff to try and demonstrate but we still don't know you know if whatever it may be the hypothalamus you know lights up when you take whatever it might be um you know we actually don't know what that is actually doing for the brain you know we can't see a picture on a brain scan and think oh that person is thinking I can fly or whatever it may be. Um, so it's, you know, although we can scan brains, that doesn't actually tell us 100% what's going on um, in terms of, you know, the thoughts of the person. Um, and I'm not sure if taking lion's mane, you'd be able to see from a neuronal perspective what's actually going on, which is why we're doing these studies on these early stage cancer cells, because you can actually see uh, changes in behaviour based on what compounds you give them exposure to on the... Um, yeah, on the petri dish yeah so with like lion's mane i guess when it comes to yeah the sort of neuron benefits and the yeah, science behind it um and the restrictions towards it i think the thing i'll be interested to know maybe down the line is kind of what would it be best for because i know with boxing it's a constant pitter patter pitter patter to your head but with things like mma it's kind of um you know you can get knocked out and that'll be it so it, but I can imagine with like elbows and knees allowed, it being a larger impact. So um, obviously, as you can tell, my knowledge on it is very restricted. But yeah. uh, if you want to sort out inflammation on the brain, you want to take either cordyceps or reishi. They have far more um, actual scientific literature for uh, down-regulating inflammation. So reishi is particularly good 
for down regulating cytokine release so cytokines are like the signaling enzyme in your immune system when your immune system isn't really functioning very well um so you get an infection your body sends cytokines down to that site and then it should inform the sympathetic nervous system to send down t cells nk killer cells different parts of your white blood cells uh but when it's not working very well your body just sends more and more and more cytokines down and so that's why people with like um rheumatoid arthritis you know knee hip ankle issues that's why so many of them when they take reishi find that it like really helps because it does down regulate cytokines and obviously during covid a lot of people were dying um when their body basically started attacking its immune system which was what's called a cytokine storm um and so so yeah if you want to down regulate inflammation in the body you wouldn't take lion's phone you take either right yeah so what sort of negative effects does inflammation have you mentioned inflammation in the brain a few times and in the body in general so what what sort of issues does inflammation especially in the brain um have on humans both short term and long term it's kind of, kind of turning more of like a doctor medical sort of uh you know podcast a bit <laughs> it's drifted away from mycology i'm not medically trained in any shape or form but i mean i think we all know what happens when you get inflammation wherever it may be it's painful and it stops the uh, regular flow of whatever it may be around the body if that's in your knee um you know it becomes very painful because everything's inflamed so lots of ligaments and tin tendons that would normally be separated are now pushing in against things it's limiting blood flow you know it's limiting blood flow and, you know it's just a complete um yeah i mean basically it, it, the body is not functioning as efficiently as it was before and it becomes painful um and yeah that's what happens with yeah don't want that yeah simply said knee your hip or your brain um inflammation's similar in a lot of ways yeah i think uh because i heard there's like there's no actual nerves on your brain but yeah i mean inflammation anywhere you don't want that especially your brain you kind of need that a little bit then well, there's no there's no nerves because the nerves in your brain are neurons got yeah so there's lots of nerves but they're neurons they're exactly the same type of cell um but they're neurons rather than nerve cells but they're almost identical in terms of their molecular structure right yeah okay yeah be there they can't feel that's that's uh, baffling oh that's why there's no nerve cells because there's only neurons got you right yeah yeah I think uh you know it's yeah very strange hearing the stories of people you know um getting like brain surgery kind of top of the head open fully awake so um you know it's kind of weird yeah same same molecular structure and then yeah you can't can't feel interesting like things in the old scientific um literature about when people used to do lobotomies and uh you know, the impact on um personalities they used to cut out the cut the severance between severed like basically the connection between the left and right hemispheres of the brain and so yeah there's lots of very bizarre stories about what goes on when you start playing around with um well stopping communication between parts of the brain or taking out specific parts of the brain and how how humans then um land up behaving in very odd ways yeah yeah the, the brain is something that's always fascinated me and uh yeah it, yeah i think i want to read more about it especially you know the medicinal mushroom side and the effects it has and the fact that we don't even know a lot about that i thought we did i thought we knew you know the core basics of it but just by um listening to what you got to say like who is like uh Hooverman does a good podcast on the brain but he's yeah there's there's some good guys doing some good research but you know i think when it comes to medicinal mushrooms the people that are well actually to be honest they're so far hiding so many things now the Chinese are so far ahead, like so far ahead, it's, it's ridiculous. We actually um, get someone to translate two um, scientific papers from Mandarin into English every month, um, just because that's where the research is. Um, I mean, the Chinese are miles ahead of us in the vast majority of things. So. Yeah, no, I, I fully see that. I think um, I looked into um, your shiitake and mataki mushrooms and they're like japanese mushrooms they're named in japan but um yeah i went to the shops went to asda and i saw shiitake mushrooms there and i thought that's you know i felt quite strange seeing medicinal mushrooms or what is perceived to be medicinal just in the shop 
I yeah, I mean, well, I think to a degree, a uh, medicinal anyway. Um, you know, they it's just that they've been studied more. I mean, even Agaricus phosphorus, the um, button mushroom, the white button mushroom, because you know, but the white button mushroom and the uh, chestnut mushroom, the portobello mushroom, are all the same mushroom. They're all Agaricus phosphorus. Uh, the chestnut mushroom just gets grown in light. And the portobello mushroom is just a very large chestnut mushroom. So, um, but they have health benefits. Um, although pool summits would lead you to believe that they also give you cancer. That was one of his wonderful comments on the Joe Rogan podcast that he refused to talk about it anymore. But I, think I did, did see that. I think they did give you cancer. Um, you know, people have been eating buttered mushrooms for a very long period of time um and yeah i don't think there's any actual real evidence that they give you cancer uh but you know who's who's to doubt the man so uh but they are very good for um there's an interesting guy called fred gillam who's a microbiologist and also a mycologist and uh he has found for people who, ha who are gluten intolerant if they eat three or four Button, raw button mushrooms before they eat bread, that creates a certain um, mix of enzymatic activity, which means that you can then eat bread afterwards without having any um, any uh, issues with your gluten intolerance. So there is some really interesting stuff you can do with all sorts of mushrooms. But shiitake are actually, you know, they're they're grown. They're, they're endemic to Asia, so they grow in China, um, Japan, and uh, yeah, maitake as well. I mean, maitake grows in the UK. Mai just means dancing. There's a little, lovely little story about um, how, when they first... Because at a certain period of time in the 17th century in Japan, if you found a maitake mushroom, you could go to your local shogun, who was basically like your sort of, the sort of local lord, and you could exchange uh, your weight of your maitake mushroom for silver, because it was so, you know, revered. But the, Jap the Japanese have a very interesting sort of cultural association with um, the natural world and seasons and this sort of thing. So there's obviously Matsutake, which is uh, pretty much the most expensive sort of edible uh, mushroom. And there's a really good um, book written by a mycologist called The Mushroom at the End of the World, uh, which is all about looking at the Matsutake um, sort of culture and harvest. And um, yeah, so I mean, the Japanese are. And she in J Japanese just means wood mushroom. So shiitake, taki is mushroom, but it just means wood mushroom. Maitake means dancing mushroom because they were so happy when they found them in the woods, apparently. Um, and they used to, yeah, I mean, there's so much folklore associated with um, fungi all over the world, really. And I think what happened in the UK is we, um, probably with the advent of Christianity, uh, when it sort of turned up, you know, whatever it was with Gregory and then Theodore later in um, the sort of sixth century, uh, but originally in the sort of second century with the Irish uh, monks. Um, and I think when you believe that, you know, you can get rid of all your ills and problems by, you know, repenting to the one true God, you sort of lose the need to understand any sort of uh, knowledge of, you know, indigenous plants or fungi from a health perspective. And so in the UK, I think that's why we're quite fungi phobic, because Christianity sort of belief in one all powerful deity means that you don't need to have any knowledge of, you know, the plants or the mushrooms around you to cure you if you can just repent and be forgiven and made well again. Because whereas in Europe and other countries, you know, there's a much, much, much closer relationship between the people still and you know, plants and fungi and native medicine, which has been lost in the UK for some reason. Yeah, in fact, talking about Christianity and mushrooms, uh, maybe you've heard the uh, Amanita muscaria mushroom, the uh, fly agaric, the typical, you know, uh, toadstool mushroom. There's, there's a book called The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross, quite a controversial book, considering it's a bunch of, um, you know, literacist, you know, English people uh, debating between it, if it's uh, true or not. But it's um, it's focusing on whether Christianity or originated from this Amanita muscaria mushroom. Have you heard about that? No, I, I, 
the one thing I do know a bit about is the history of religions, because that's what I studied and what I continue to read a lot about. And um, I, and I know a bit about mushrooms as well. And interestingly, I, I've never heard of this one. I mean, I do know, you know, the reality with the um, Sami shaman and Amanita Muscaria and how that plays into various, um, you know, stories to do with Saint, uh, Saint Nicholas in Germany and Saint, who's become a Santa Claus. But, and that, that, I think, is probably true. But I don't know about this latest one about Jesus. <laughs> Let's hear about this one about Jesus then. Yeah, so I think it was the guy who translated the Dead Sea Scrolls. I could be completely wrong here, so um, don't don't quote me. You know, if, uh, your mushroom mates down the line. <laughs> I think uh, there's the guy who translated the Dead Sea Scrolls said that Christianity, the origin of it, was misinterpreted, and actually it was kind of God allowed it to rain, and then once it rained, the Amanita muscaria mushroom grew. And then that allowed them to see or perceive God. And there was a load of cults around that sort of era about, um, you know, cults around these mushrooms. And I don't know, it seems far-fetched just hearing it. Uh, I've skimmed through the book. Yeah. But, yeah. The point I'd make is that um, Amanita muscaria is, is a mycorrhizal fungi. So mm -hmm. that means it has to have relationships with certain types of tree. Uh, and it tends to also have um, a mycorrhizal rela relationship with, uh, the Belletus family of mushrooms. Um, so those are things like porcini and uh, set de Bordeaux. Uh, or penny bun, they're called in the one of them is called in the UK. So the types of trees and the climate in what was Judea in the around the time of Herod probably weren't a huge number of forests that would have had the right climate for many Amanita muscaria to grow. I don't actually know if Amanita muscaria do actually grow in that part of the world anyway, but quite a lot of the Amanitas are more, uh, like for example, I've, I've heard someone posit something about uh, Amanita pantera um, being used by um, various tribes in Southern Africa. The panther cap it's like a sort of cousin to amanita muscaria i mean it can be poisonous if you know you don't get rid of the acid uh, before you take it but that that mushroom simply doesn't grow in africa um so it's it's you know it's bullshit um but there is a mushroom however that does grow in the desert uh which is a type of um truffle that does actually have psychedelic um where well, it has psilocybin in it or psilocin, uh, which does grow in that part of the world. So maybe that's what they were talking about. I, because that I've heard that before, that there is, because there is this type of truffle that does grow and people have posited that maybe that's manna from heaven. And I've, I've heard of that, but I've never heard anyone say anything about Amanita muscaria from that part of the world. Yeah, even when I first heard it, it did seem a bit far-fetched, obviously, you know, well, never say never sort of thing. Maybe, maybe, but... Uh, Amanita Mascara, have you? Oh, well, sorry? You ever taken Amanita Mascara? I have not, no. no. It's quite a heavy trip. It's not It's not one that's likely to make you uh, believe in God. <laughs> it's sort of, you become sort of, it's very dark and you don't move very much. It actually, you sort of become rig and water sized. Uh, it's not a particularly pleasant experience. Um, so it's very different to, you know, cubensis or other types of sort of you know, magic mushrooms that have, because the, the, the compound in Amanita muscari is musca, um, musca, musca, muscamol, uh, what's it called, Mus, muscamol, um, whereas obviously in other mushrooms it's either psilocin or um what's the one that that they synthesized to make um ergon the one that they synthesized to make lsd from um so yeah i mean I, on so many levels it doesn't make sense yeah Sorry. in fact talking about the ergot fungus actually it was uh i heard something else it's probably you know who knows but um, it was the witch trials. It was actually because the ergot fungus infected wheat and they were eating the wheat. And then they kind of just thought some people were witches and that's how the witch trials started.
Well, I mean, there's again, you know, that's a little bit more pragmatic uh, reasons for that. So, in just about, uh, I think about 15% of the uh, women, at least in Salem, who were um, burned to the stake, and she came from Jersey, which is where half of my family come from. And in Jersey, for, before the before everyone, you know, went to Plymouth and got the boats over to America. Um, they they'd be quite a strict form of protestantism uh, very similar to what a lot of the founding fathers were and women for about 60 years had been banned from uh singing or dancing and so the girls used to meet up at night and go into the woods so they could sing and dance you know we all know that you know girls love singing and dancing boys like singing and dancing as well not quite as much as girls but <laughs> they do but boys are allowed to sing at church the girls weren't and so, um, yeah, and so what happened is, uh, you know, they went to the States. It was still this very strict form of um, sort of Luther Lutheranism. Um, and uh, yeah, they, they were going off at night and meeting up and singing and dancing. And there, there is some, you know, there's some things in terms of the, um, oh, I forget which herb it is now. Um, oh, which herb is it? Oh, I forget which one it is, but they used to put on their boomsticks. Uh, and so, you know, potentially it was quite stimulating for them if they put this particular herb on their broomstick. But I mean, the one story that is probably true to do with sort of folklore and hallucinogens is probably the Amanita muscaria with um, Santa Claus. Because the Sami people, um, who are the sort of uh, northern sort of um, reindeer herders, so in the sort of Targa in Siberia and Finland and places like that. They're, they use Amanita muscaria a lot in their medicine. Amanita muscaria is undeniably good for back pain, like sci sciatica and stuff like that. Um, so use topically, Amanita, Mus and Amanita muscaria tincture can be very useful from a health perspective. Um, but the Sami, it was the, the, the shaman of the Sami who were like the medicine people. They would quite often um, take Amanita muscaria to sort of uh, connect with the um, you know the ancestors and stuff and to get knowledge but what they would do is they would um, obviously be pulled by reindeer and the, the way of getting into the Sami tent is to climb up and go down the pole in the middle just like Santa Claus and so you know the fact that Santa Claus you know is supposed to come down your uh, your um, your chimney, which is what the Sami medicine men would have done, and he had a sleigh, you know, which flew in the air, towed by reindeer, which is what the Sami, you know, medicine men did have. I think that's probably a reasonable, and obviously St. Nicholas was, you know, the sort of northern Germanic um, patron saint, and they do border, you know, Finland and Norway and Lapland and all that sort of stuff. So I think there is probably there is probably some level of truth to the um, the sort of myth of Santa Claus coming actually from, you know, Amity, Sammy, uh, Shaman taking Amity to Muscaria. But that seems totally plausible. The other ones that you've mentioned, not very, not very much. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah, I've never, I've never quoted those ones too much. I think, uh, yeah, there is, um, I guess with the Santa Claus one, there's a lot of breadcrumbs kind of going yeah. It. it seems like a lot of hints towards it but uh <laughs> there's guys coming down the middle of a house <laughs> yeah there's, and there's magic mushrooms so yeah all three of those seem to join up relatively and they still do it to this day that's the other thing i mean it's not like um you know you can still see these men doing exactly this, the same stuff that they did millennia ago yeah that's no, fascinating i think uh you know now it's led to materialism black friday you know buy a tv discount you know all, all of all started from the so that, and the scary mushrooms that's the uh that's the way of uh maximizing return on you know um, on labor in a very short space of time and we are geared towards um you know maximizing profit irrespective of cost nowadays and unfortunately we're very easily led and with the amount of data that's now collected about us so we're, we're not very unique we're not very special we're quite easy to you know sell yeah, to. yeah. <laughs> and so uh, 
Yeah, just go out and buy my tinctures. I just need to spend some, some money on advertising. Of course, yeah. I think, because um, you mentioned the the truffle, the psychedelic truffle, that was potentially, you know, instead of the Amanita muscara mushroom. It's so, in that part of the world. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, truffles, they're also mycorrhizal, right? And uh, I heard that it was actually in Merlin Sheldrake's book, The um, Entangled Life, really good book. He He mentioned that the reason why pigs can smell it I found out is because of the um androstenol hormone that's in it and that's why pigs can smell it because sows smell that for the for the males and that's what allows them to you know the pheromones to allow them to realize that they're in the area i think dogs can also smell it but i think they eat it so they just kind of stick at pigs yeah well pigs did pigs used to eat them as well you know that's why if you have a look at any of the old um you know pig truffle hunters back in sort of you know you go back couple of centuries into it they had these massive long uh metal like beaks that they put on their pigs to help them dig up the soil faster and to stop them from from eating it, it looked proper medieval the contraptions they used to put on their pigs and there was actually this year there was the first um truffle truffle dog competition in uh sussex the first one in the uk ever um i was going to take my dog along but she's very large and you know she's lovely but she's useless so yeah. but yeah so that it's definitely making a resurgence i mean with um the truffles that we get over here which is sort of the black truffle there is there's about four different truffles but only sort of two of them are any good any good for eating um is you need like uh lime like a cal calcified base uh, i don't i don't think we totally understand why that is but there's a really big Institute uh, just outside Barcelona, who have Im they now impregnate a lot of the um, the roots of trees with uh, liquid mycelium from these particular type of either black or white um, truffles, and there there is some success in growing them there. Commercially, as long as you plant them into land that is on limestone or calcium, then it you know it does seem to work. Yeah, no, it's uh, yeah, very interesting stuff, and never had truffles. But all the psychedelic truffles, you know, as of yet. But um, yeah, see, we've mentioned. Well, no, they're different ones. There's a psychedelic truffle called Atlantis, um, which is really, really easy to grow. Um, it's not very strong. Um, but there's, yeah, I mean, in England, you just need to go to Wales in October uh, and you'll be fine. So um, it's, it'd be interesting. Though, I haven't really read a huge amount about what uh because the thing is the druids were really our sort of link to this sort of plant knowledge and obviously they were there aren't any druids left anymore and any druids there are, are probably not that well versed in some of these things so yeah we've sort of lost our connection to that side there's a, i mean fundamentally the thing with christianity was it was the marrying of the mythic of the jewish um desire for revelation with the um sort of greek and then later roman uh desire for logic and so those two things came together to create you know the new faith which was christianity i don't think it had anything to do with amanita muscaria um unfortunately <laughs> yeah of course it's quite interesting actually the fact that you got a background in religion history and then now you're learning all this, you know, mushroom knowledge. And there's such a massive link between the two, even though some of it is, you know, false folk tales sort of thing. There's a clear link between the two. Yeah, but the thing is with um, with all knowledge, fundamentally, it comes from a desire to understand what's going on in the world around you. And um, you know, that's why we now have scientific knowledge. Uh, it changed, obviously type of science up to sort of the period of darwin where we we're all going off and you know collecting data and it was all about that type of you know sort of um quantitative uh data and trying to like in victorian times count the number of everything and try and create this whole sort of taxonomic reality and then fundamentally when maths came in and then physics um sort of the late 19th century maybe a bit earlier we started to to come up with you know being able to use maths to try and solve what had previously been the remit of philosophers um, and philosophers obviously previously had been viewed as the top scientists and now 
it's physicists and so it's sort of gone away and, and that's why i think why mycology is so attractive to a lot of people because it's the only real natural science left where you don't have to have that that um sort of knowledge in maths or physics to really make um some genuine advances it's the whole you know the classic that everyone's got physics envy to a certain degree um so we're in a yeah i think that's why because it harks back to that earlier period where you didn't need maths or physics to make great strides and knowledge um and so yeah i mean basically you know religion has been created to try and you know give us certainty and allow us to park our ignorance somewhere where we can feel comfortable um and that's where you know people used to use herbs and mushrooms to try and answer these questions but yeah not only that but there's a massive hunger for knowledge around the world even for people that aren't scientists there's a lot of scientific minds that are interested in learning this stuff so when it comes to research there's i mean as you talked about the lion's mane there's so much more that needs to be learned that there's a, there's a clear hunger for this knowledge and i think mycology is one of those things where yeah but i think i think the hunger for this knowledge comes because people want to believe uh with lion's mane that the issues in their heads and that if they can sort out their heads everything else will follow um, unfortunately, life's a bit more complicated than that. But you know, we live we live uh, in an environment now where there is a deep need for connection um, because people are not feeling very connected. There's no sort of villages anymore. There's no you know sort of there's no communal gathering places apart from nightclubs, pubs. But people don't even go to the pub as much as they used to. People, people. I mean, nightclubs are always there, and there's a bit of renaissance now um but yeah there's a deep lust for connection and uh i think as everyone's become more atomized by modern technology the thirst and need has just grown yeah i saw that i saw like a graph that said you know the release of the iphone and smartphones and as it kind of like got older and older there's yeah less and less connection um between humans so there's definitely a, a need for that and also, i think attention spans has collapsed oh um, yeah TikTok and all that yeah well, not just TikTok, but it's Facebook originally. Then it was Instagram. <laughs> now TikTok is like the, the most extreme example of just, you know, short term nothingness. Um, yeah, and it's kind of funny for me because I follow a lot of like the younger tech entrepreneurs all sort of in the e-commerce game. And um, yeah, they love TikTok. Love TikTok. It's very easy to spend money and get conversions on it. Um, so... Yeah, it's sort of it's sort of the ideal environment. It's like a sort of post post capitalist playground for people who to advertise stuff because uh, it's just it's remarkable how you know much madness there is on there. And and yeah, I mean it's amazing. I was shocked when we went on it a few weeks ago, and I was like, wow, this is even worse than Instagram. And um, yeah. Instagram's pretty bad. <laughs> so uh, yeah. Give me a yeah, book. pure hyper stimulation by the looks of it, and yeah. Uh, yeah, the amount of views you can get on that is insane. People getting like 150 million views from something they filmed in their smartphone, it, it's just mind blowing. It is means absolutely nothing, <laughs> so, um, but, yeah, but it does hit. Yeah, you could speak a lot about Jungian um, psychology and the impact, impact that it has on, yeah, course, yeah, anyway. <laughs> Yeah. So, um, yeah, talking about, um, you know, psychology, the minds, I think we can drift into the, uh, the mental benefits of mushrooms. You've got psychedelic mushrooms and there's a lot of research on that. You've got Robin Carhart Harris and, uh, you know, a bit of Paul Thammett as well. So, um, yeah, the, the sort of benefits that that can have on, uh, mental health and depression as well is some of the main studies. So, um, you know, what, what's your thoughts on the studies at the moment that have been done mainly on like, you know, depression and other mental um benefits that psychedelic mushrooms are seen to have yeah okay um so robin's a very sweet guy um he's now over in where is he now john hopkins i think um again i'm slightly i, I don't dispute that um I don't think there's much argument anymore for profoundly depressed people. Uh, there can be value in um, taking psychedelics. 
Uh, I think the issue is that you do need to probably take them regularly. I'm slightly, well, not slightly, I'm very, I'm much more skeptical about um, some of the sort of ketamine analogs, as I know a few of the characters in this scene um, who have, uh, that's the best way to describe it. I mean, you know, they have done PhDs, but because someone's done a PhD doesn't mean you need to listen to them. Um, and I've sort of seen them socially on a few yeah. occasions as well. And um, yeah, I think, you know, again, I think we need to be careful. I think in terms of PTSD and depression, like really profound depression, um, they can kick you out of it to a certain degree. Um, but the reality is, you know, the environment they have to function in is exactly the same. They have to, you know, they, they cannot operate in the space of just being given left field um, stimuli, which makes them re-engage with the here and now. So, yeah, there's undoubtedly a role for uh, psychedelics for some people. There's, but you need to be very careful at the moment. There's a huge amount of money in this space at the moment. Um, and we've experienced it with biotech companies coming to us, offering to fraction off some of our compounds. Uh, you know, it's like you've gone for hours and hours about this particular side. Anyway, I'm, I'm much more cynical, to cut a long story short. Um, I think for PTSD and for extreme um, depression, where like a lot of standard medication isn't working, uh, I think, yeah, potentially. And I think just for general humans, every, you know, year or every two years, having a big, you know, reality check through psychedelics is not actually a bad idea at all. Um, you know, making you realize that we're all fundamentally you know, connected and we shouldn't be too arrogant uh, is a good thing. But the idea that well, psychedelics offer some um, some sort of utopian future is bollocks. I mean, I, I grew up in the rave generation where, you know, you could go clubbing, there was lots of football hooligans there, you know, it was every, every strata of society men who had you know bludgeoned other men men who you know were gay men, you know it's just everyone was like together but that was all because of drugs that was all because of ecstasy ecstasy popped up we we're all cuddling each other and like they're now using ecstasy mdma you know therapeutically and i don't dispute any of this you know but the idea that we can create some utopian vision of society without actually fixing society just by people taking a pill. Uh, because if you look at, for example, that study at Imperial, pretty much all the guys that were on that documentary, if that's the one you're referring to, um, had quite profound short-term change. And I think only one of the 12 actually had profound long-term change. And it was sort of heartbreaking seeing some of them, you know, just return to type after three months. And I think the issue is, you know, the issue is not entirely in our heads. Our society is pretty dysfunctional um, and we need to fix our society more than we need to fix our heads. You could argue that, you know, we need to fix our heads in order to fix our society. But So I think for profound um, issues like PTSD for soldiers or, or anyone who suffers from PTSD, profound depression, I think, yeah, there's potential applications. But you've got to bear in mind that if this does go through, it'll be the pharmaceutical companies who monopolize it. It'll be unbelievably expensive uh, and it's going to take years to happen. So, you know, I think this, we don't want to get too overexcited. There's, um, you know, we can go and walk up the Welsh mountains and pick kilos of magic mushrooms. And if the world is, this was going to radically alter the world, it would have happened. You know, a long time ago, because people have been taking these things for a long time. Uh, but I do think for people that are in a really bad place mentally, um, 
it's it's helpful i think there's enough evidence i mean if you look at all the studies that were done in the 50s especially with alcoholism so with addiction like i think there was like over thirty thousand people in the 60s in the 50s who went through um psychedelic some type of psychedelic uh experience and it was the the reality with the alcoholism it was something like 80 over 80 percent of the people who were alcoholics got off you know alcohol so i mean the, there is a huge amount of data from the 50s which shows it's really useful for addictions and potentially for um people that have have, have suffered extreme trauma um so that would be sort of ptsd type people now but i don't think it's gonna radically alter the state of our societies which is what i think needs altering rapidly yeah there's almost like an innate desire for humans to sort of experience older stages of consciousness you know for alcohol as well i'm guessing yeah yeah fair history i mean jesus yeah. whirling dervishes and the idea that you and you don't need psychedelics to do this you can do this through chanting you can do it through dance you can do it through breathing you can do you know there's so you know throughout you look at any culture there is the desire to you know get out of it <laughs> with a view to understanding the the mythic and i think i think that's the the big thing that's lost from um sort of neoliberal sort of anglo-saxon um, capitalist economy is there there is no space for the mythic anymore because there's no real space for god um and so the mythic the sort of mysterious there isn't really a space for it and yet as humans we all have a need for you know there to be this space for myth or uncertainty and and i think that's what we're missing we're missing that sort of slightly you know the thing that sort of appeals to our soul uh, however you want to structure that and so um yeah at the moment we live in quite a soulless society probably the, the most soulless society ever pretty much that's quite a bleak way yeah to put it but uh well we do yeah, we you're not wrong you're not wrong I mean, well, you know we don't you know it's not like we, we there's nothing greater than ourselves that we celebrate there's nothing there's you know there's nothing that we don't believe we can understand there's no space left for the mysterious or the mythic and and so much of what's um beautiful beautiful about life is um you know the space where you don't have to know because we have this you know innate desire to know everything um and like just making peace with not needing to know everything is or ne not needing to be perpetually informed um you know so yeah has that, think, increased? Sorry? Has that increased sort of as time goes on because like uh you know now of google and like now of chat gbt especially you know it's kind of like oh i've got a question you can immediately get the answer for it 100 percent, yeah 100 percent. i mean i i yeah but the, the the interesting thing is it's not so much I think I think we've um, I think what's happened is we've become unable to ask the interesting questions anymore, just because you know we're not thinking as well as we used to. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, yeah, with, with AI and everything else, I mean, God knows where that's going to play out because fundamentally we're not that special humans. We're not we're not that useful. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, it's not a good idea. I don't think to um, to allow something to be able to perpetually outthink us we're not that bright <laughs> it's, um... yeah there's way too many films we've seen man. i don't know who's developing these yeah but they need to watch like terminator a few times i think yeah yes but now i mean I'm, I'm pretty confident that um that i mean fundamentally we need more jobs not less jobs at the moment there's a lot of idle hands <laughs> and uh and the one thing that, uh, if anything, the last 200 years of industrialization have taught us is that, you know, with the advancement of technology, generally doesn't improve things for most people. <laughs> it does improve things for some people. Uh, we might get more free time, but uh, in terms of general happiness levels, uh, I don't think any advancement in tech is going to make us any happier. Uh, I'd say the last probably... 25 years is probably tech has started to actually have the opposite effect on people's happiness yeah no of course i think when it comes to yeah monopolization you know technology i think some people at the top are quite willing to boot off the people at the bottom you know for the sake of that and um you know you see it 
I guess there's a um I forgot his name, but he wrote this book called Cobalt Red and that um you know that book there and it's about the cobalt mines in Congo and that that's just that's just insane. It's just yeah, pure slavery mining for cobalt um you know that we can use for phones cars. Oh my God. Look at any. I mean, I, interestingly, I once upon a time worked at a nickel refinery in Western Australia. So I, was, I worked on a mine and slept underground and did all that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, like you look at you know you look at any great, great, you know, wealth. There'll be a great injustice just behind it. And um, yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. yeah, it's a whole other thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. drifting away from the mushrooms of it. Yeah, yeah. You know, you look at anything, and behind it, there is something terrible. Uh, where the that's what I was saying earlier in terms of the fact that um, you know we've become very good at uh, extricating or maximizing profit without actually paying the cost of it, uh, especially in terms of you know carbon or whatever else it may be, and so. Um, yeah, we're we're like we're running a heavy deficit to the earth at the moment, and um, to be naive enough to think that that doesn't is not going to cost us in the short term or medium term or long term, uh, yeah, it's a little naive. But um, yeah, and I just think you know there are potential applications for mushrooms to maybe remedy some of this. But for example, in one of Paul Stamets's books, he wrote about. Um, using the spent substrate from uh, mushroom farms to clean the rivers and waterways because mushrooms are quite good at taking out or isolating heavy metals and nitrates and phosphates and stuff um, which is, that is true mushrooms are good at taking that stuff out and we did a, a little uh, project here um, and used our spent substrate put a fixed amount of mpk in and put it through six different um, six different 50 litre tanks with spent substrate in and none of them apart from the freshly impregnated one took anything out so we're actually doing a, a project later this year with arab uh, it's a civil engineering firm and uh, welsh water to create like a mycelial sort of matting outside a sewage plant to see if that does anything so they'll pour you know their overflow sewage will go through this mycelial bed before it goes into the river um but our actual research on, on like you know cleaning you know water and i guess progressing towards a more sustainable future with the mushrooms yeah we the research we've done doesn't seem to make much difference but arup have obviously sold this project to welsh water and have come to us for like technical advice and to make all the substrate to put there and um the interestingly actually what is interesting is the one mushroom that might be quite good for what they that potentially is quite good at this is uh, something called a caramel cut which is actually a psychedelic mushroom which is a wood decomposer and because a lot of psychedelic mushrooms um grow off shit you know fundamentally they like high nitrogen and so um yeah we probably won't actually be able to use the best type of mushroom for the micro remediation because of the fact that it's got some potential psychedelic well it's got a lot of psilocybin in it so um, it's kind of ironic how you know, we won't actually be able to use the best mushroom just because it's got certain compounds in it that um, can make you see experience things in a different way. Yeah, that, that is that is quite strange. But I actually didn't know about this about how you can you know use uh, mycelium mushrooms to you know progress towards clean and water. It really is yeah well, crazy stuff. They're using uh, um, I can't remember what type of mushroom it is, but yeah, to try and get to isolate gold out of rock. So they actually, you know, um, with exactly the same as they do with lead and stuff in terms of they uh, pull it into the fruiting body, you know, they could potentially, people are trying to do it with you know, gold and various other things. Because mushrooms are actually quite biddable. They're quite easy to train on um, agar. You know, you can strain select based on, you know, just simply putting something on agar and, and teaching it to eat that food. Like at Chernobyl, there's... I think there's four different types of fungi that are now growing within the um, the actual um, big lump of concrete they put over the top of it, and they're all using um, the um, radioactive 
the radio waves as energy sources, although they're obviously um, radioactive. So yeah, fungi are pretty good at doing all sorts of things. I was going to say, yeah, just um, from reading, I think, Entangled Life, there's, you know, they're extremophiles. They can they can live in so many different environments. You know, you send, like, lichen to space, you dehydrate it, and you send it back, you know, ages later, and then rehydrate it, and it's back to normal. So I'm not surprised. I didn't hear about it, but I'm not surprised that, well, you know, you can go to Chernobyl. Thors can definitely survive in space without any issue. You don't have to do it. They, they're absolutely fine. And they found some spores that were 20, year, 20 million years old, uh, when they did, the Japanese did when they did, were doing some drilling in Antarctica, and they actually managed to fruit those those mushrooms twenty million years later, and so I mean, that's a very long period of time, and that's that's why there is that whole theory that life on Earth, I think it's called uh, Plasmodia. No, yeah, Plasmodia, something like that. Um, the idea that basically an asteroid came bringing fungal spores, and they were actually the the basis for life on Earth, which is not actually too far fetched, because we know that spores can survive for a very long period of time, um, and can survive in space as well. So it's not completely implausible, but um, it's still quite unlikely. Yeah, I heard something similar. I, I heard that there was an asteroid, and it contained. It's quite recent, I think. It may have been Australia, two thousand and eleven. I could be wrong, but it contained ribose and ribose you know is necessary for dna it's, it's necessary for all life so that that landed there and it kind of yeah brought the idea of maybe an asteroid came in and you know started life whether it's a spore or um through ribose so i don't know that's quite a cool quite a cool thing to think about so technically humans could be you know aliens on this earth not yeah so well, that's quite, quite a weird thing but it, you know it's almost um it's completely unlikely that you know we are the only people or the only the only you know intelligent life and, i mean there's just the universe is so vast you know there's it's almost certain that there'd be other life out there um, yeah we're talking about space though i mean spores in space isn't that quite a concern because with you know elon musk and nasa we're, we're sending more and more things out of space if we have spores contaminating those things you know the spaceships or satellites we're sending out there if they have spores on it can that can that infect like you know if we send that to certain places or what um contaminate certain areas what's the like um mushrooms probably came into being about 1.3 million years ago 1.3 billion sorry um and for the first maybe 300 million years on earth there was only the only kingdom was the fungi kingdom then there were bacteria and viruses and that was it um the amount of time it would take fungi to you know learn to break down whatever it may be is a very 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 long period of time you're talking millions of years and bear in mind that homo sapiens sapiens have only been around for you know, Best case, maybe 1.2 million years, more like sort of in our current form, maybe, you know, well, in our current form, you know, we've all got decimal, well, we don't all have decimal, but some of us have decimal in DNA, some of us have, you know, Florian DNA, some of us have, uh, well, in Northern Europe, we've got what, on average is a 2% um, uh, Neanderthal DNA, so, you know, in our current form, we've only been around for a few hundred thousand years, so, you know, you don't need to worry in terms of what's relevant to humans and what's relevant to actual life on earth are two very different things where you know we've only been here Just yeah evolutions yeah it's a very strange one it's yeah it's always been fascinating especially as someone that does you know biology but um you know yeah never know see we'll have to see how uh humans you know, the one, you'll never know <laughs> because you're yeah. not your children aren't going to be around you're growing, you know you're talking so thousands of generations after you um and the chances of us still being around in thousands of generations is you know who knows who knows, who knows? maybe you know evolve alongside fungi who knows we'll, uh, can't predict it the reason we've got you know enzymes in our tummy is because uh fungi developed enzymes that they exude out of their High full nodes. Um, the reason we exhale CO two is because fungi exhale CO two. We're in that direct lineage of fungi. So yeah, on the tree of life. Yeah, you see. So you got you know uh, plants because 
people see plants, they see fungi, and it almost like they look somewhat similar. They're on the floor, they're sessile, they're just growing out the ground. But you look at the tree of life, you've got plants going one direction and another direction, you've got fungi. And then off that is every animal to have ever existed. So yeah. humans are closer to fungi than they are plants. Any animal ever is well, closer first, to fungi. Yeah, the, well, the first kingdom on earth was fungi. So you could argue everything comes from fungi. The first, the first plants had no roots. They had mycorrhizal relationships with uh, fungi. So, you know, and there's still quite a few. There's not that many. There's a few hundred um plants that have relationships with fungi and that's it there's a lot of plants that have relationships with trees so there's those ones that are popping up at the moment called the ghost something i don't know what they're called um what are they called but they're popping up in woods all over the place now these white flowers that pop up uh, and they have no leaves they don't photosynthesize and so um yeah without fungi there would be yeah there wouldn't be anything so um yeah, there wouldn't be us, there wouldn't be plants, there wouldn't be, there wouldn't be any soil, there wouldn't be, yeah, I mean, there literally wouldn't be anything. So, uh, yeah, they're quite, they're kind of important. I mean, they're instructive in terms of, um, you know, they've managed to survive for 1.2 billion years. They're going to survive way beyond us. And so, um, yeah, we don't need to worry too much about fungi. Yeah, of course, about. yeah. I think <laughs> the, the fact that it grows everywhere. You know, yeah, I'm not surprised they're the first kingdom. And above, above your head, if you like, uh, if there was a column above your head, there would be about three billion spores going up to the stratosphere above your head. So you're breathing in spores with every breath you take. You know, it's like, yeah, I mean, it's just it's a fact of life. We are from yeah. everywhere. I actually read that on average, there's about ten thousand spores that land on at one leaf a day. Yeah, yeah, I mean, they're, they're everywhere. I mean, it's such a primary, such a basic way of reproduction, just creating, you know, colossal quantities. I think reishi or, uh, or any of the Ganodermas that you see in the woods, I mean, they can release billions of spores every single day just from one of these um, conks that you see growing. And so, I mean, it's a very low success rate way of, you know, reproducing we got much better like the plant kingdom got much better the animal kingdom got much better um but the fungi kingdom fundamentally you know they just play a numbers game and uh but yeah and in terms of you know the sort of sex side of fungi there's um in order to protect the sort of dna side they they release a huge variety of um fertile spores but just with a huge variety of genetic um disparity in them and so um yeah so some people have argued that that you know at the moment with this sort of desire to um view gender as a sort of loose um some sort of, uh, sort of the term that you can identify with individually a lot of people are looking at fungi and saying you know they're the sort of original um sort of queer um yeah, the original sort of queer reproducers. Yeah, it's a bit of an anthropomorphism in that the reason they do that is because it was very early on in the um, sort of evolutionary tree and they haven't worked and more, worked out a more efficient and less wasteful of energy uh, approach to reproducing. So, yeah, as ever, you know, we always try and make things uh, applicable to our current mindsets, um, which isn't necessarily always entirely true. Yeah, you can definitely see that, um, yeah, with humanity, really. I think there's a lot of cases where, you know, humans don't really live long enough to see the trends in humanity. So, yeah, like you said, they kind of, yeah. Yeah, read history, and then you might find some some reality. It doesn't have to be all about magic mushrooms and gods and everything else. Just read any history. And, um, you know, there's been lots of psychedelics taken by every, pretty much every culture on earth ever not just mushrooms be it whatever it may be um and so the desire to connect is you know it's a human need and um yeah and i think that's one of the reasons why mushrooms are now very popular in the uh in the sort of um yeah in sort of society at large because mushrooms offer the ability to connect and therefore when people do take mushrooms they feel connected and i think there's this thing because they're natural 
as opposed to, you know, man-made people have some sort of affinity with, you know, thinking because it's natural, it, you know, it is inherently good or something. I don't quite understand the logic, but but it's it's a nice idea that God put these things on Earth to make you feel more connected to Earth, and when you take them, you do feel more connected. And I think what's interesting from a medicinal perspective is that a lot of these compounds that fungi have developed over millennia, or way over millions of years, um, because of where we sit in the uh, evolutionary tree, a lot of these compounds our bodies can actually make use of. Um, so in particular, fungi beta glucanes, uh, which because of their molecular structure, which is 1316, which means they spike off the third and sixth carbon atom. Our human uh, immune receptor cells recognize that shape and can make use of them. There's quite a few others as well. Um, so I think that's that's kind of that's great because it's something that we haven't really made a huge amount of use of over the last few centuries. I mean, interesting. I was reading a book by uh, Cole Pepper, or well, not by Cole Pepper, a biography of Cole Pepper, who's one of the original herbalists in the sort of 15th century. They were called um, apothecaries back then. And one of the two um, tonics for the London plague, the main ingredient was a, a, a mushroom called a garicon which is a type of Ganoderma from the Pacific Northwest. Um, the elixir and, of life, isn't it, nicknamed? Well, I think I think that's what Paul Stamets might nickname yeah. it. <laughs> so, but it's interesting how that mushroom was um, a large constituent part of one of the two uh, London tonics that were given in the 16th century to people with the plague. Um, so, yeah, it's kind of, you know, nothing's new, really. Just people forget about things and then... Um, you know, think that they're relearning them for the first time. Yeah, no, it's fascinating. I think you now got you know the hunger for connection. That that's why we're on you know Google, Zoom, Microsoft Teams. You know, there's there's definitely a you know everyone wanted to connect. I think the pandemic showed that a lot as well with uh, everyone kind of. The difference is that people um, people weren't connected, and you know, fundamentally, we're not connected because you're in. Uh, you know, we're physically not connected. And I think um, people lust after the physical connection. We get some level of connection by this sort of 2D experience, but it's um, it's not quite the same. Yeah, it's almost like tricking your brain somewhat thinking you're connected. Maybe that's why, you know, scrolling through social media, kind of just yeah, hoping to be connected. And obviously, yeah, right now, yeah, it's obviously done online. So... Phone call with a screen <laughs> yeah 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 it's definitely lacking lacking that actual human connection how humans evolved alongside yeah. you know you've got your context which is yeah yeah i can't smell you touch no. you or buy you a drink <laughs> so we're uh yeah we're a few hundred years uh out of date for what has worked previously in, in this in this culture in this country for the last thousand years of course yeah so your website is uh, Bristol Fungorium. Bristol Fungarium. Fungarium. Bristol and, Fung uh, if you want to uh, have a look at what we're doing, have a look there. I mean, it's, very, it's it, like we're selling a lot of product now, um, which is great because we've spent, mm, we haven't spent any money now for over a year on like any social media advertising or anything like that. So it's all been going through word of mouth. Which has been great. And also other companies spending a huge amount of money on trying to sell their products that are not, not quite as um, robust, should we say. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's and like, we, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm quite cynical, but some of the stories that people tell us are pretty extraordinary. And so um, it's quite amazing doing something where you genuinely have every week, three or four people ring you up just being so thankful um because of changes that they've experienced um and so that's yeah although i sort of blase about it it is quite you know, it's quite profound you know yeah i can imagine it quite fulfilling you know especially getting yeah, you know, yeah. people genuinely you know reaching out to you it's not it's not fake it's not doing it you know for exposure it's just genuinely reaching out to you and saying thank you so much but as I want, but the fact is, it is actually true for them, you know, and we have had some unbelievable stories, like genuinely unbelievable stories about, you know, various different things that 
people have been suffering from and uh, for decades sometimes and um, and claim they no longer are. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's kind of amazing. No, it sounds great. So all, all the stuff we've covered today, not all, but the majority of stuff like lines, main cordyceps, etc. That's all sold in extract form on uh, at Bristol Fungarium. And uh, lots of shops anywhere near you. Although we did just recently refuse to be stopped in Holland and Barrow. So, um, yeah, you will never find us in Holland and Barrow. <laughs> also never find us on Amazon. So we are a principal company. We're not on Amazon. We're not going to be in Holland and Barrow. Uh, which means that we're probably never going to be very well off. <laughs> but uh, such is life. That's fair enough. And the uh, the code, the affiliate link is George twenty. It's twenty percent off in it. It's George twenty. Give give uh, give fantastic George twenty a go. There we go. Yeah, twenty percent off. Uh, supports supports Tom. Supports me. And uh, you know. Support me. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But, yeah, yeah. So yeah, everyone everyone benefits off it. It's a win win win. That's what it is. A win win. It's like like some sort of mycelial happy space. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right, Tom, it was great speaking to you. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed. Do give it a like and subscribe and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.